We've been in the book of Amos, and as we've been in the book of Amos, we looked at the first chapter where uh, we looked at the topic, have you heard a lion roar? Because the text says that the Lord was roaring from Jerusalem, and he's roaring with judgment upon the, the people. And we turned in the second half of, of that first chapter and into the second chapter, and we saw there was an expression for three sins and even for four that I likened unto Three strikes and you're out. And uh, we had all these batters come up to the plate. And they were all the surrounding nations of Israel. And he was pointing out their sins for why God was going to judge them. And boy, I'll tell you what, Israel was really happy. He's like the person sitting in the pew and knows, wow, the preacher's preaching to the guy next to me. Until he gets to the last batter, and the last batter was Israel itself. And God says, listen, for three transgressions or sins, and for four, three strikes, and you're out because of your blasphemy. You have been desecrating the name of God by the way you live. The next chapter uh, talks about, hey, God is calling. Are you listening? And God was calling. He called the nation, and he called the prophet but they were not listening to the prophet as the prophet was preaching. And so today we come to the topic, avoiding respectable sins. Ooh, that's an unusual name of a sermon title, huh? Avoiding respectable sins. I've heard of mortal sins, venial sins. I've heard of sins of commission and sins of omission, but I've never heard of respectable sins. You may never heard them, but I'm sure you practice them. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all do. So respectable sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says this, Pursue holiness, for without it, no one will see the Lord. You don't hear too many mega churches or stadium-filled churches speaking about, you've got to be holy, or you will not see the Lord. You know what they teach? You need to be happy if you want to see the Lord. It's like God exists for your happiness. Nothing could be further from the truth. God demands holiness. You know it says in the Bible, be holy for I am holy? It says it a couple times. I've read my Bible through several times. I've never found a verse that says, be happy because God is happy. Most people want a happy marriage. Do you know the Bible never tells you you're going to get a happy marriage? God wants you to have a holy marriage. A holy marriage. It doesn't matter if you're happy or not. He wants you to be holy. Holiness is the number one attribute of God, and God wants us to be holy. Now, what is holiness? Holiness is being set apart from sin. Wow. God wants me to be set apart from sin. You see, when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, I was imputed the holiness of Christ. So in position, I am holy in Jesus. But in practice, I still have the old Dennis with me. And the old Dennis is not holy. So the Bible tells me, pursue holiness, because now in Christ you are holy. So act like what you really are in Jesus. Wow. That's why I want to start this message. But I want to ask this. What are the respectable sins? Well, here I got a little definition. Any sins with which we get comfortable in our lifestyle and we stop taking them seriously, that becomes for us something we're comfortable with and it becomes respectable. We allow it to have our respect. Respectable sins. Well, there's such as. I got a such as here. These are seven old respectable sins. After the apostles passed on, the next generation of the disciples listed seven of these. I'm calling them respectable sins. They called them deadly sins. You know why they're so deadly? Because we're so comfortable with them. We're so comfortable with them. Here's the first one. Strong sexual cravings. Lust. There's nothing new under the sun. You think this one is still with us today? Oh my goodness, of course it is. Lust. The second one was overeating or gluttony. 
Hey, folks, is this one still with us today? Now, there's a big difference between obesity and gluttony. Obesity is a condition of being overweight, and it could be genetic. You can just genetically be overweight. You see, you can be a glutton and be a skinny person. I was for most of my life. It's now catching up with me. I could eat anything I want, and I was a toothpick. I was a toothpick. All right? Gluttony is overeating, while obesity is just, you got a weight problem. That's it. It's not sinful to be obese, but it is sinful to be a glutton. So what is gluttony? I had a case of it yesterday. We went to lunch. And after lunch, I said, oh, I ate too much. You ever been there? Ooh. Every time you say that, you're saying, I am a glutton. You admit it. You admit it. Third one, selfish desire for things. Greed. 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 I'm just greedy. I, I want to get all that I can. I don't care who I got to trample on to get it. Greed. Is greed around today? Of course it's around today. Is it respectable today? Yes, it is, just like it was back then. The whole idea of climbing the corporate ladder, doesn't matter who you trample on to get there, doesn't matter at all, as long as I'm the guy on top at the end, I'm greedy. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Fourth one is laziness. They call it sloth. Slothfulness. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> Why would I mow the lawn today when I can mow it tomorrow? Why would I? And you just put it in whatever, you fill in the blank. Laziness, laziness. We're putting off what we should do today to tomorrow. Strong, vengeful anger they listed as wrath. Getting angry. Do people get angry today? You ever had somebody commit road rage against you? Better question, have you ever had a little road rage? Passed somebody, gave them the good old Italian salute and kept on your way? You know, these sins are still around. We become comfortable with them, okay? Then the next one that they listed was a desire for what others possess. That's envy. I want what others possess. It might be material things like a house or a car, or it might be relational things, a good son or a daughter, parents that love me, blah, blah, blah. You go on. It might be emotional that why the other people are always so happy and I'm so doggone depressed all the time and you're envious of other people for what they have. And this is what I found in the, the old uh, adage is true. The grass is always greener on the other side until you get there. You just don't know what boulders are underneath the sod of that grass that is in their lives that they have to deal with. Envy, envy, envy. The next one was just thinking a little more highly of yourself than you ought. We call that pride. I'm number one. It was back then, and it's still here today, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Well, then I thought about some that are some modern respectable sins, like pro-choice. Here is a sin of destroying an image bearer of God in a preborn condition for the convenience of the one who has power over this little baby. It saddens my heart that we have a president who is using our tax dollars to fund abortions, not just here in America, but now overseas as well. It's not enough that he wants to murder our babies, he wants to murder other babies too. And I don't know how we as Christians cannot stand up and speak out against it and cast our votes against those who want to murder. 63 million Americans had a silent scream in the womb when the probe was coming after them to crush their body and then suck them out. Modern respectable sin. 
It's not respectable to speak up against it. Why, you're speaking against the freedom of a woman to have her choice. What choice? To murder the image of God. There's others. Casual sex, adultery, and fornication. It has become so acceptable, you watch it on TV. It's in nearly every single program. The people are not married. They're having relationships. It, they, they portray it as being something so wonderful, and God hates it. And we condone it because we don't turn the channel. We don't find something wholesome to watch. It has become a respectable sin in the time in which I live. There's another. The termination of a marriage. Divorce. Malachi says, God speaking through his prophet, I hate divorce. I used to say, you know, no, no one who hates divorce more than God except the divorcee. Divorce is brutal. brutal. It is not God's design. It's not in his interest. But today, we, people actually go to the altar with prenuptials already signed so that they have a way out. We'll just separate everything when we get out of this. They have really no wholehearted, full-in commitment. Prior generations to us had this promise to thee, I betroth thee, betroth thee, I give you all my wealth, all my wealth. All in today, it's, uh, let's decide whose is whose before we ever have to get out. This has become so acceptable in our culture. I call it a respectable sin. Respectable sin. Sex with the same sex partner, even marriage to the same sex partner, gayness, gayness is not a respectable thing at all. Romans chapter 1 tells us that when that happens, God is giving the people over to a reprobate mind. And people say, well, but we love each other. Well, if you really love the other person, you would seek their highest good, and their highest good is what God wants for them, and God does not want you to have a lifestyle like that. If you really love the person, you would not do, you would not desecrate them nor the institution of marriage like that. The Supreme Court has made it legal. Well, the Supreme Court has made bad decisions before. They made ungodly decisions before. Dred Scott's a terrible case. That black people aren't a full human being. Are you kidding me? The Supreme Court is not God. We go to the Holy Scriptures. But yet this is a respectable sin in our culture today. It's okay. Identifying as transgender, like, God, you made a mistake. When I was conceived and you assigned to me my sexuality... I either have an XX or an XY chromosome shot through my whole body, every little part of me from my toenail to my hair. It tells me who I am. It's scientific. It is who I am. But now we treat doctors as God and say we assign your sexuality at birth or whenever time we want to. We, God made a mistake. No, God made no mistake. Transgender people are so totally confused, they can't even tell who they are. And they're miserable. If not at first, over time, they become very miserable because they are missing the purpose for which God created them. Our hearts should break. Cancel culture. Oh, that's kind of a new one to me. Cancel culture has really become close your mouth, don't talk back. The majority or whatever who's in power, they're correct and you're wrong. Do not dissent. Do not disagree. It starts out in a mild case. You don't agree with my political party, and so I'm going to shut you down. You can't speak. Wait till it comes. We don't like the gospel. You shut that down. Don't you dare speak. Whoa. I'm telling you right now, you got one pastor who'll go to jail over this. I will. It's the word of God. Like the prophet said, how can I but not preach? How can I not preach? Violence in our cities, violence everywhere, defunding the police, lawlessness in our culture. You know, it's become respectable. We almost say, well, yeah, that's Chicago. 
right? Here's what happened in Chicago this year. Chicago. There is a person who is wounded every two hours and 45 minutes. Wounded. There is a person who dies every 14 hours and 28 minutes. Almost two people every single day. And you know what we say? Oh, yeah, it's in the news. Doesn't matter to me. It's not Waterford. It's a respectable sin. Oh, that's Chicago. It's not bothering me. It should bother us. It should bother us. We should be grieved that our country has degenerated so much. I know you're thinking, I'm going a little bit too far. You say, well, preacher, you know, you're just picking on all the flaws in our country and all the flaws in, in our lives. And, but wait till you see what Amos points out. <laughs> wait, wait till you see what he points out. That was a long introduction because I wanted to get to this. Luxury. He identified luxury as a sin. And I know what you're thinking, boy. You go after Bezo, and you go, you go after Gates, and, and, and you go after uh, Zuckerberg, and you go after all these billionaires. Go for it. I'm all in your corner. These wealthy people, they got so much. Here we're in poverty. I want to tell you something. It all depends who you compare yourself to. Here's the fact. 734 million live on less than $2 a day in our world. All of a sudden, that makes you, that makes you the wealthy, luxury, living person. I can't even get a gallon of gas for two bucks. Do you know what? If I go to Burger King or McDonald's and just get the meal, it's almost 10 bucks. They are living on $2 a day. Wait a second. That's what the World Organization considers being in poverty. You've got less than two bucks a day to live on. Suppose you got $5 a day. <laughs> they don't even consider you in poverty. Still in poverty. Yeah. All of a sudden, we are living in luxury. We are. We're the luxurious ones. Now, unless somebody has to say to those who are living in luxury, so it becomes a, a message that's directed right to me and right to you. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women, now listen, I am not calling any of the women here cows. I'm a smarter man than that. And I don't think he's talking about a lady in a Halloween costume dressed up like a cow. And he's really not even saying, hey, you're fat. He's not saying that. The comparison to the cows is that you have fattened yourself for slaughter. You have fattened yourself for the judgment of God. Why? Because you live in luxury at the expense of others. You women who oppress the poor and you crush the needy. Wow. It's not like they got in their Cadillacs and, you know, or... Their BMWs and drove out and ran over the poor people and the other side of town to crush them. No, 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 no. They live in luxury and they've hardened their heart to the condition of other people and they don't take out of their luxurious wealth and give to those who need it. Wow. You say, hey, you say to your husbands, bring us something to drink. They're so cold and calloused and hardened. They can watch those commercials on TV with the suffering children where they're just skin and bones, and they say, oh, my heart's not even touched. They hold back out of their pocket when they could donate to a person who is in need, and, and they know it. Their heart's not touched. They're cold or callous. Listen to what he says. The Sovereign Lord says this. He's sworn in his holiness. Oh, Holiness. The God who's set apart from sin wants us to be set apart from sin. He's sworn in his holiness. The time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks. 
I didn't know exactly how to illustrate that. I tried to make it as less gory as I could. Ugh. And the last of you, when I've run out of hooks, I'm going to use fish hooks. Oh, that just sounds painful to me. You will go, each of you, straight out through the breach in the wall. An invader's going to come. They're going to tear down your walls. They're going to pull you out. And I know ex historically exactly who that was. It was the Assyrians. They destroyed Samaria. They pulled them out through the walls, and they took them to Harmon. Now, we don't even know where Harmon is today. Just like we don't know what happened to those tribes. Ten tribes of Israel totally lost, never went back to their land, declares the Lord. Luxury. The second one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. A hypocrite is someone who wears a mask. They pretend to be something that they are not. In the ancient Greek world, uh, they didn't allow women to be in the actor's guild. It was only men. And so for a female role, they get a boy who is pre-adolescent. His voice had not changed. And so he'd talk. He could speak. He'd wear a mask, look like a woman, and he would speak. But his career was short-lived because as soon as he past puberty, he got a deeper voice, couldn't play that part. So they called him, while he was playing that part, a hypocrite, pretending to be something he was not. God says, go to Bethel and sin. Oh my goodness, if you were to take the Bible out of context, you'd have a verse here to go do anything you want. Go to Bethel and sin. He's being facetious. He says, go to Gilgal and sin yet more. He says, listen, what you're doing at your religious places when you go to church, it was actually to the, these cities back then in Samaria or the northern kingdom Israel. He said, when you go to these places, oh, just sin all the more. You're sinning like crazy, sin all the more. Bring your sacrifice every morning. Yep, just bring it in. I mean, oh, you bring the sacrifice. God doesn't want sacrifice. He wants obedience. Sacrifice is a correction for your disobedience. You give a sacrifice because you disobey. He says, I don't want sacrifices, I want obedience. Just obey the Lord. You bring your sacrifice every morning. Oh, your tithes every three years. Some texts have every three days. The idea is, oh, you think that you can put the cash in? You're crushing people, you got the money, you put the money in. Oh, didn't I do a good job? I supported the this is hypocrisy. Burn leavened bread. Now, leavened bread was not supposed to be given to the Lord. The Lord wanted unleavened bread. Leaven is a picture of sin. He's saying, even your worship is shot through with sin. You bring him as a thank offering, and, a, and you brag about your free will offering. Do you notice he doesn't mention, like, a, a sin offering, a whole offering, a, a peace offering? No, no, he's talking, thank, thank you, God like the Pharisee that went into the temple and said, thank you, God, I'm not like this publican sinner over here. He's bragging about his worship, and he's boasting, and he says, this is what you love to do. He's exposing even more sin. They are hypocrites. They worship on Sunday, and they live like the devil the rest of the week. Whoa. Now, the next one is obstinacy, stubbornness. You've seen a, a toddler get pretty stubborn, stomp his feet, yeah, cry, scream out, do whatever it is to push your button. God's accusing his people of that. He said, I gave you empty stomachs. Listen, I'm disciplining you. I gave you empty stomachs. You had famine in every city. There was a lack of bread in every town. Yet you have, yet you have not returned to me. I'd spank you, and you just go, <laughs> you think that hurt? Oh, I can handle it. Is that all you got? And we kind of do that, too. Then he gave them drought. I also withheld the rain from you when the harvest was still three months away and I sent rain on the towns and, and I withheld it from another. One field had rain, another it had not, and it dried up. The people staggered from town to town for water, but they did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me. Listen, I spanked you all the harder. <laughs> he said, this 
still. Is that all you got? Obstinant, stubborn. Many times I struck your gardens and your vines. I struck them with blight. And he says, then I sent the locusts and they devoured. And this is what he says. And yet, you have not returned to me. Why? They love their respectable sins. They're not giving up on them. I sent plagues among you as I did in Egypt. Remember the ten plagues of Egypt? The last one, the eldest son died in every home where the blood was not applied. He said, I killed your young men with the sword. Along with captured horses, I filled your nostrils with stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me. I overthrew you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do you overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? Because of the Sodomites. Because they were gay. Read it in the Bible for yourself. You were like a burning stick. You're like Lot and his family. I pulled them out of that. I snatched them from the fire. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Ultimately, this is the ultimate obstinacy. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this, prepare to meet your God. Whoa. You're not going to be facing a happy God. You're going to be facing a holy God. A holy God. Who's set apart from sin. The soul that sins shall surely die. Whoa. I found this verse kind of helpful every now and then. I'm in the hospital visiting somebody. they got a condition that's terminal. I just go to Amos and I say, are you prepared to meet your God? You see, at a point like that, the person is open to say, I am or I'm not. I am or I'm not. And several times, just prior to their death, I, I'll use, are you prepared? And we talk about what preparations you need to make. And the person asks Jesus to save them from their sins. And they're like the thief on the cross who couldn't even come down and get baptized. But they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they go to heaven and be with him forever. Wow. Prepare to meet your God. Here he's not saying it in that sense. He's saying judgment is coming. Are you prepared to give an account of your life to a holy God? He who formed the mountains and created the wind reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns the dawn to darkness treads on high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. You're going to give an account to the God who created you. Wow. My time is rapidly going, and I want to touch on how you avoid all this. How do you avoid all this? <laughs> How do I avoid these respectable sins? Number one, you return to the Lord. That's what he said. Five times he said, hey, you're going one direction, turn around, come back to the Lord. You need, we call this repentance, you need to turn from the lifestyle you have and turn to the Lord. That's what you need to do. Secondly, I got here, you just say no. In Titus 2, it says this. Before there was a campaign on by our president, uh, you know, just say no to drugs. Uh, The Bible says, for the grace of God that brings salvation. God brought salvation. It's appeared to all men. And if you accept the salvation, that salvation teaches you to say no. (laughs) Say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright lives, uh, godly lives in this present age. The first point it places, I I, I see that there's this problem in my life. I've got a respectable sin, and I need to get rid of it. So I I turn away from it and turn to the Lord, and every time it comes knocking on my door, I say, no, I'm not answering the door. I'm not going down that path anymore. Next, he says, sometimes it really pursues you. 
Joseph was a righteous young man, but Potiphar's wife saw that he was handsome. Potiphar's away. She says, come lie with me. He said, no. You know the story. He flees, just like it says in 2 Timothy. Flee the evil desires of you. He flees. She grabs his cloak. And, 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 and when her husband comes home, says, he tried to rape me. Look at this guy that owns this. He winds up going into prison for doing what is right. You see, God is more concerned about our holiness than our happiness. I'm sure Joseph wasn't happy in prison. <laughs> but he wants us, he was a holy man, and God blessed him for his holiness. His holiness. You live by the Spirit. I love these verses. These are powerful verses. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, 17. So I say, live by the Spirit. Now the word live in the Greek is actually the word walk. You take one step at a time. That's walking. When I stop, I'm, I'm not walking. It's used as a metaphor for life. I live moment by moment, moment by moment with the Spirit of God. Amos asked the question, we saw it last week, can two walk together except they are agreed? And the answer was no. So if I'm going to walk with the Spirit, I've got to be agreed to the Spirit. Not that the Spirit is going to condescend and live in my sinful world. He's not respecting the sins I respect. He's saying, clean that up and walk with me. If I live by the Spirit, he says, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You won't have any of those sinful, those respectable sins. You say, no, no, not in my life. Uh-uh, that's not going to be there. He then adds this. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. The sinful nature is the one I was born with. I was born a descendant of Adam, and all are born into this world by sin, Romans 5, 12. And as a result, I have a sinful nature. When I got saved, I got a new nature. So in my life, I have two natures. I have an old sinful nature, and I have a new godly nature. The sinful nature desires what is contrary to the godly nature. And the godly nature the spirit, what is contrary to my sinful nature. Bottom line here is the two are in conflict. Boom, boom, they're, they're fighting. I have this fight every day, so I know you have this fight too. Every day. So which one's going to win? Dr. Barnhouse at the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia used an illustration I like. You kind of look at it like your old nature is a black dog and your new nature is a white dog. And they're fighting dogs, and they fight each other. He said, which one will win? Everybody kind of said, he said, the one you feed wins, and the one you starve loses. If I will starve my old nature, say no, flee, and feed my new nature, be in the word, be in prayer, following the scriptures. Even when I don't feel comfortable, don't feel like doing it, I do it. I will be led by the Spirit of God. Fifth, you put on Jesus. In Romans it says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Everyone has a sin that so easily besets them. You know what it is. I may have hit on it today, maybe not. Maybe it's something much different. You know what it is, and you can set yourself up to make provision for that. You can put yourself in the path where that, that temptation is going to come to you and you're going to yield because you know in the end you'll feel good about it. And then when you feel good about it, as soon as you've caved to the decision, you feel terrible because you got guilt. You didn't, you didn't put up the struggle and fight. He says, how do you avoid that? You put on the Lord Jesus. And I got a rope here. <laughs> you put on the Lord Jesus. And somebody said, uh, when, when the devil comes knocking on your door, you send Jesus to answer it. You send Jesus to answer it. Six, you renew your mind. In Romans chapter 12, it says that you are to offer your bodies living sacrifices. I like this next word. Holy, set apart from sin. Holy. I'm to set apart my body as a living I'm going to live for the Lord. And it's pleasing to God. And he says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. You ever seen a jello mold? 
You make up your jello and you pour it into the mold. Then when it gels, you flip it over upside down and it looks just like the mold. That's what he's saying here. The world has its mold of all the respectable sins. And if you pour your life into that, as soon as it gels, you flip it over, you look like the respectable, sinful condition of the world. And that's exactly what Amos has been preaching against. Wow. What he says instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It starts in your mind. You have to think differently. So how do you think? Paul tells us in Philippians, whatever is true, is there truth to it? There is so much fake news out there, don't believe it. You find the facts for yourself. Whatever is noble, it's noble before God. Whatever is right, that means it's just. It's just, it's correct. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You've got to change the way you think. Your respectable sins can no longer be respectable. They've got to be evil sins that you want to avoid. I'm going to substitute my cravings for that junk into my life for holiness, righteousness, godliness, goodness, love. I, I'm getting rid of all that junk in my life. And finally, pray for help. Pray for help. It tells us in the book of Hebrews, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. It's pretty hard to commit sins when you're on your knees praying to God. Very hard. Very, very hard. Now, I'm not saying the moment you get up, the temptation's not back again. I'm just saying while you are praying, it's very hard to be tempted. And if you're praying to the one who is able to give you mercy and grace in order to overcome the obstacles of your life, you just keep praying and praying and praying. Sometimes you just have to pray all day long. It's an ongoing conversation. You just let everything else in life come on into that conversation with you. You don't leave a spirit of prayer. You're always constantly in prayer all day long. So what's the point? Here's the point I'm trying to make. You can avoid respectable sins if you want to. It's not that you can't, because you can. He's equipped us. He's given us. It's, do I want to? 